Okay, so good afternoon. I think we are we are ready to start. <clears throat> um, it is a great pleasure to have uh, as our guest uh, today, uh, Dr. Cedric De Koning. Um, I'm going to introduce him in a, in a minute. Um, but um, let me let me just check if everyone is connecting. Sorry, just a second. I think I think so. Um, as part of the normal procedure in this case, uh, I have to remind everyone that um, this lecture is going to be taped, and uh, and then uh, is going to be posted on the website of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Trento. So, um, for privacy reasons, uh, I am asking everyone to switch off uh, your um, video and uh, at the end of the lecture there will be the opportunity to ask uh, questions uh, and if you do, uh, you can do so by turning on your video and, uh, and, and uh, if you do it, you accept to be taped and, to be, uh, and the video to be posted online. If you prefer not to be taped, uh, you can pose your questions in the chat. And uh, this uh, class is part of the uh, uh, Jean Monnet project. I co-direct with the um, Osservatorio Balcania Caucaso based in Trento, called uh, it's a Jean Monnet chair called uh, the European Union and the Western Balkans uh, Enlargement and Resilience. So within this context, I'm very pleased, very happy to have as our guest today. Dr. De Koning, who is a research professor with the Norwegian Institute of um, International Affairs, where he uh, co-directs uh, the Center on uh, the United Nations and Global Governance. He coordinates uh, the effectiveness of peace operations uh, network and leads the climate-related peace and security risk project. He, also, he is also a senior advisor for the African Center uh, for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes, and, uh, and he is the author, uh, is widely published, uh, the author of a very large number of very interesting publications on issues related to uh, peace building, uh, African politics, uh, peacekeeping, the United Nations, and global governance, and so on. And perhaps I'm forgetting uh, some issues, I apologize if I do. Um, um, so thank you, Cedric, for being with us uh, today. So, uh, um, Dr. De Koning will talk for about, what, I guess, one hour and 15 minutes, more or less, and, uh, and uh, then uh, um, we'll open up the, 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 the virtual floor for uh, uh, questions. So, so thank you again, and I look forward to uh, your lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto. It's an absolute pleasure to be uh, with, uh, with all of you this afternoon. Um, I'm going to uh, activate my screen sharing in a moment so that I can use a, a PowerPoint uh, to make it easier for, for all of us to, to follow the presentation. Um, but please um, do let me know if um, my connection is bad, for instance, and we can try something else. I can switch off my video or things like that. And uh, if you have a burning question, um, whilst we are uh, going on, please do feel free to also interrupt me. So I'm going to talk about uh, the role of uh, resilience in adaptive peace building. Um, and I'm going to start by covering a couple of key concepts. And then I'm going to talk about uh, complexity theory and how that is linked or creates a framework for my discussion around the role of resilience in peace building. And then I'm going to focus on adaptive peace building, which is a particular approach uh, to peace building that I've been uh, working on. And within that, I'm going to talk about how adaptive peace building is different from determined design or mainstream peace building, if you like. I'm going to focus in on our main topic on the role of resilience. Um, but I'm also going to, to talk a little bit about adaptive peace itself and the methodology we use. And, and I'll share one example of, of where uh, I have personally been involved in applying adaptive peace building to, to UN peacekeeping operations. So first of all, a couple of, of key concepts. 
Um, so we are talking about peace and peace building. And uh, maybe one key way to frame our discussion about peace is to understand the kind of difference between negative peace and positive peace, where negative peace is, is, is essentially the absence of violence. So the kind of description or definition I'm giving here for, for a negative peace is where no significant social or political group in a country is seeking to resort to violence to achieve their ends, their interests, right? And where the majority of the population believes that political differences should and can be managed peacefully. So it goes a little bit beyond saying just that there's no violence. It talks about what the society needs and requires also uh, for there to be no violence. And I think this is one of the, this kind of distinction between negative peace and positive peace is a bit uh, black and white and simplistic in the sense that in order to have negative peace, you also need many, many elements of uh, positive peace. And so positive peace here describes uh, the definition I'm using here is from the Global Peace Index. And uh, they say positive peace describes the attitudes, structures and institutions that underpin and sustain peaceful societies. People will also talk about positive peace as you know, when you have social justice in a society. And as you can imagine, this is a kind of an aspirational um, dimension because there's, there's probably no country in the world that really have positive peace and meeting all the possible requirements. But uh, if you're interested, have a look at this uh, Global Peace Index uh, and see how they rate the different countries in the world. But the interesting thing about peace, and we'll talk more about that later when I talk about sustaining peace, is that you know, it's not something you have ever achieved as a country or society, community, and then, and then walk off and say the job is done because something can always happen, uh, a situation can always deteriorate. As we've seen, uh, for instance, in the United States of America, where many of us have, have uh, over the years, you know, thought of, of America as, of course, a very peaceful country. Uh, and even you can see in a, an advanced established democracy like that, there can be an erosion of the kind of uh, public trust and social trust that you would imagine they, they have enjoyed. Uh, and, and it could make, can make the situation much more volatile than one imagine. So it's, it's not something that is ever achieved. It needs to be always sustained and, and worked on. So if we go from that broad understanding of peace, then what specifically is peace building? So now we're describing a particular process that uh, facilitates the establishment of durable peace. So in other words, yeah, durable peace is a word for a sustaining peace, a peace that lasts, that is able to withstand uh, shocks and setbacks, um, and that tries to prevent the recurrence of violence, right? This is another way of saying that we, uh, what you try to do uh, in a conflict or after a conflict or before a conflict to prevent that that society will, uh, what we say, lapse into violence, uh, will resort to violence. Um, and the way to do this is to address the, the underlying or root causes, the structural causes, if you like, and the drivers uh, that affect and, and generate conflict. And the kind of things that peace building is typically involved in would be, you know, after a conflict situation, uh, after a violent conflict, uh, like in the Balkans, the focus would a lot be on reconciliation or on institution building, as well as political and economic transformation. But peace building is not something, uh, I mean, an older, older approaches to peace building was very much in the post-conflict context. So after a conflict has happened, what do you do to help to restore that country to peace and to, for it to, be, to remain peaceful? But today, peace building is huge, much broader, and we'll talk about that in a moment when I introduce the sustaining peace concept to also include prevention and so forth. So in terms of uh, you know, who does peace building, peace building refers to to all the actions undertaken by it could be international peace builders, it could be local peace builders, and the work that they are doing to, to sustain the peace in a given uh, particular uh, political context. And this would normally involve uh, one of the, I think, elements of, of peace building is that it's so multidimensional. So of course, 
by with a peace building focus, your focus is on peace, which means uh, there's a, a strong political focus, but there's also elements of security or security sector reform, uh, developmental uh, projects, the economic uh, dimensions, social, social justice uh, aspects, as we mentioned, reconciliation, etc. So one of the elements of peace building is the fact that you need to, to um, somehow work across or at least coordinate all these different dimensions in order to have a, a kind of a whole of systems effect on the society that you are trying to, to, to help. Now, one thing I want to say with peace building is that the, uh, the word suggests building, a kind of an engineering concept is, is assumed in there. And we'll talk a lot more about, about the, the challenges with that kind of thinking around peace that peace is something that we can build, that, that uh, uh, society is something that we can fix. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. So I also want to introduce to you the concept of sustaining peace. Um, this is a new concept introduced at the United Nations uh, after the 2015 review of the UN peace building architecture. And basically, I would say it represents kind of four shifts in the, in the conceptualization around peace building. The first is that um, peace building is often something we think about as, as something that international actors, the United Nations or international NGOs or so on, do in a community that is affected by conflict. So it's something that international actors do uh, in, in, in that kind of community. Um, and the sustaining peace concept shifts that primary agency from the international to the national and local level and say that uh, the people who have the most capability, understanding and responsibility and agency to affect peace are our local and national actors. And the role of the international actors should really just be to support those actors. And then secondly, it's a shift. It represents a shift away from peace building is something that, you know, the political actors do. So for instance, in the United Nations, you have the secretariat which is different from the developmental agencies and the humanitarian agencies. And within the secretariat, you have a particular department of, of peace building and political affairs. And you have a structure like the UN peace building architecture, which includes a peace building body called the peace building commission, where member states sit. And, and, and what this shift represents is says it's peace building is not just the responsibility of the peace building commission or of the department of political and peace building affairs but peace building is the responsibility of it's an overall objective sustaining peace is an overall objective that the whole united nations uh, system needs to achieve and there's the human rights element there's humanitarian element there's those people working on un women there's the development agencies there's also those working more on peace building and peace operations and the political dimensions more directly but it's the overall effect of all these functional areas um, the dimensions. And, and the third point also speaks to this, but more institutionally, that it's responsible of the whole UN system to, to work together towards achieving sustaining peace. And fourthly, uh, very relevant for our discussion today on the role of resilience, uh, it says that the, the key instrumental focus of the United Nations should go beyond its current emphasis on kind of a just-in-time capacity to to respond when a conflict is emerging already. So uh, you, you hear in the news about a conflict, for instance, in the news currently, Ethiopia, uh, and then you launch some kind of a response to that. And so that's too reactive. We should get away from that. And instead, the focus should be on supporting national and local actors to develop the resilient national capacities they need to address the kind of root causes that we know are likely to create conflict in time. So things like structural inequalities, exclusion, marginalization uh, that we see in societies, that we know these things where they are present, they will undermine social cohesion. And if they're neglected over time, they will lead to violent conflict. And so prevention is about addressing those issues before they become, uh, before they even emerge as, as some form of, of, of violence or conflict. And that is why other dimensions of the UN system, like especially development and economic uh, dimensions are so important in this prevention element. Uh, 
So let me move on from sustaining peace to then this larger picture of the sustainable development goals. You know, this is a particular agenda that was adopted in, in, uh, in 2015. Uh, with the goal to achieve a number of, of, of objectives by 2030. And these cover things like poverty and, and the environment. And we have 17 sustainable development goals covering the whole spectrum. And it, it represents a kind of a worldwide agreed set of objectives that everybody should work to. And not just in underdevelopment or fragile countries, but in Italy or in Norway, I'm from South Africa. Uh, and in every one of these countries, there's also a need to, to work towards and achieving these sustainable development goals. But one of the sustainable development goals, sustainable development goal 16, talks about fostering peaceful, just and inclusive societies, which are free from fear and violence. So we see this as kind of the peace building goal, if you like, within the sustainable development goals. And of course, it talks about how closely interlinked sustaining peace and sustaining development are. But there's also a number of targets um, and indicators in some of the other goals. So for instance, there may be a goal about, or there are, there's a goal about uh, the rights uh, of, of women. And within that goal, there will be a specific target about preventing, for instance, sexual and gender-based violence. And so that's also related to conflict and peace. So across the SDGs, there are, uh, are 36 targets across seven sustainable development goals that measure different aspects of, of please, peace or inclusion or access to justice. And that's why we talk about the sustainable development goals 16 plus as a kind of an overall agreed framework of goals and targets that spans the development government and, and peace building uh, nexus. Uh, and so I would think of all of these together as a way of, of framing what peace building is and what we are trying to achieve with peace building. So let me then come to resilience. So resilience refers to the ability of a system. And here I would, uh, when I talk about a system, uh, we can of course also talk about uh, resilience in the context of an ecosystem, uh, many different types of systems. But for our purpose in talking about peace building, we're talking about social systems. So we can talk about local to global social systems, uh, whether we're talking about a local community, whether we're talking about uh, you know, a nation, how resilient is Italy or Norway or South Africa when it comes, for instance, to, to the COVID-19 pandemic or other such external shocks. Or we can talk globally, how resilient is the international community to deal with, uh, for instance, uh, uh, threats like a nuclear war or, or other types of international global dealing with uh, climate change, for instance, right? So resilience refers to the ability of a system like that to withstand shocks or setbacks uh, whilst retaining or recovering essentially the same fu function, structure uh, and feedbacks and therefore its identity. So basically it's a system uh, that faces some kind of a shock or setback or stress. And it's about how does that system withstand and deal with that shock or stress in a way that if, if, it is a, if the system is resilient, it will uh, absorb the shock, it will adapt to it, it will respond to it, but it will somehow manage to maintain its overall function and structure and identity, or at least recover fairly quickly uh, from that. So that is basically what we consider in terms of a scale. Now, this definition, uh, which really comes from the environmental context and thinking about, for instance, you know, how resilient the coral reefs are or how resilient some kind of a ecosystem, the Amazon forest is to climate change or to some other dynamics. And then it has been applied and, and has developed and spread, you know, in many different in different ways. It's also very prominent in, for instance, development thinking in disaster management. Uh, but it's also becoming much more uh, prevalent in 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 peace and peace building context. But in this context, um, this definition, I would say, is a little bit conservative in the sense that it it only really talks about um, uh, you know, balancing back to, to what it was before. Uh, 
Whereas what we see in social systems is that very often part of adapting or dealing with this kind of shock or setback is also part of an adaptation, an evolution, a transformation. So even if a social system is different after dealing with such a shock, um, as long as it retains, if, as long as it doesn't relapse into violent conflict, as long as it retains its core identity, that would still be very much resilient. In fact, we, we know that social systems need to be under stress uh, to develop, to transform, to deal with some of the, the, you know, the challenges that develop over time. So if we talk about things like inequality or exclusion or racism in a society, for instance, right? We know that that society needs to come under stress for those elements to change. Otherwise, if there's no stress, there's no reason for that society to, to change. So some degree of stress is that brings about adaptation and evolution and transformation is desirable uh, in, in a social context. But what is not desirable is, is a society you know, resorting to, to or relapsing into violent conflict. And that's why that definitions of peace and negative peace and positive peace are so important when we talk about resilience um, and what we, what we regard as, as the kind of uh, resilience that we, that we want to pursue in this context. Another concept that is very closely related is adaptive capacity. So here we're talking about the, the ability of a society or a system to thrive in an environment characterized by change. So now it's not just about you know, surviving somehow, some form of stress, but it's an acknowledgement that we, we actually need some form of stress to, to develop, to, to evolve. And uh, that if we are a society that is resilient, we can actually thrive in an environment characterized by, by stress and by change. But obviously, there's a, there's a, there would be a, an element where we thrive, and there would be an element where when that stress and, and pressure and shock crosses a certain threshold, uh, that may become too much for the society to handle. Right? So in the peace building context, it refers to the adaptive capacity, it refers to the ability of a society to adapt to disruptive change. And, and in that process to take advantage of the opportunities that is created through that uh, stress, but also to, to respond and manage to the consequences. And as you can imagine, resilience and adaptive capacity is, is, is very complementary and, and mutually reinforcing. Resilience is perhaps a broader concept that goes beyond just adaptation, whereas adaptive capacity focus specifically on, on, on that element of resilience. And then I want to introduce a third concept that is also, I think, very important in this context. And that, refer, that is about um, what are the elements in a society that, that make and that, that are the resources that a society have, uh, the public goods that a society have, both in terms of its individuals and its social institutions, um, that helps it to, you know, to be resilient, uh, to have adaptive capacity. And this basically relates to the, to the networks and resources, um, and the norms, the values, the understandings, the facilitation that, that facilitate cooperation within or among groups in our society. And so social capital, uh, and this is a concept that's very well developed for those of you who study sociology, you have studied sociology as well. This is a strong concept. And, in that, uh, that field. And social capital thus refers to how social networks facilitate understanding and trust, and in that process enable people to work together. So for instance, um, we've all seen how COVID-19 has affected different societies across the world and how those different societies have responded. And one element that was, was critical in terms of the ability of different societies to respond to this crisis is what we can call social capital or public trust or trust in society and in state institutions and so on. And we can see that societies that have had more trust, more public trust, uh, perhaps dealt with this, the crisis differently. Um, and so this is a, a, a very important dimension because especially if we say we want to develop help to develop the resilience in a society, uh, 
it means we want to help to develop the social capital of that society. So collectively, resilience, adaptive capacity, and social capacity, capital describe a society or community's systemic capacities to organize itself and to learn and to adapt in response to, to some form of significant disruption. So this gives us, I think, now uh, the key concepts that we need to work with in understanding peace and understanding uh, resilience. So I'm going to turn now to, to introduce you to complexity or complexity theory. Um, I mean, I'm sure you have come across that when we talk about uh, the Balkans or other types of conflict situations, we would say that the situation is very complex or the conflict is very complex. And what does it mean actually when we, when we say something is complex and what are the implications for us? Um, well, I, I, in, in asking those questions and thinking about it, I actually discovered that there is an existing science of complexity, a complexity theory that spans uh, uh, it's a very interdisciplinary theory. We, we find it in biology and physics and philosophy, uh, in mathematics, um, and, but also then applied to, to most of the areas that we work in, including development and, and peace and security and conflict. And I've worked especially on uh, applying some of the insights we get from complexity to, to the field of, of peace studies. So I think to unpack what we mean when we say something is a situation we're dealing with is, is complex. Uh, I think we are, we are referring both to the um, large number of factors and dimensions that are at play. So very complex causality that is, that is underway and the uncertainty that this creates, right? So if you think of uh, the Balkans or another area where the international community or national and local actors are trying to work for peace. Um, there are so many different actors, um, so many different um, dimensions that need to be taken into account. So one gets the sense of you know, no one is in control. Um, uh, we don't know where to start. Uh, how do you deal with this, with this, with this situation? Uh, you can work on this, so I can work on that, but it's such a small element, right? It's that kind of sense of, of complexity. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the fact that what is very different in these settings from how we deal with, let's say, an engineering problem, like building a bridge, um, is that we're not dealing with a passive problem. The people that we are dealing with are constantly uh, interacting with the interventions that we try to introduce. And there are some people that are um, gained, that, that are um, benefiting from the current situation that we want to try to change. There's some people that even benefit or profit from war and from conflict. And those people will resist and try to find ways of, of undermining what, what peace actors do. Um, so it's a, it's a very active um, system that you're trying to influence. And that system is constantly reacting to, to what you are trying to do. Um, and so that's both, the complexity lies both within the system we are trying to influence, uh, but also within ourselves as, as the peace builders, whether it's local, national or international, we are also a very uh, a large complex number of actors representing different disciplines, different cultures. Uh, we come with our own interests and objectives. Um, and this all creates a, a, a complexity also within the dimension of the peace building actors that are trying to, to, to uh, generate a particular effect in the system we're trying to <clears throat> achieve. And we don't necessarily have the same objectives um, or our objectives may be largely the same, but we may have different priorities, which, which makes our cooperation very difficult. So this is where uh, complexity theory, which is a particular uh, approach and understanding of complex systems. So complexity theory, complexity science studies these complex systems and analyze them and come up with an understanding of, of how complex systems uh, uh, behave. Um, so 
this complexity gives us uh, complexity here, meaning the, the theory, the science, the understanding of complex systems. Complexity gives us a, a theoretical framework uh, for understanding how systems, so in our case, societies, uh, function. And in the case of, if we think about complex and peace, especially it tells us about how these complex systems react to disruptions. And you can think of peace building also as a disruption, an attempt to change a system. So the system will, will can see attempts at peace building also as a disruption to, to the system. Um, and I say they're ontological and epistemological. These may be concepts that you're not that familiar with, but essentially what it means is ontological refers to how we understand, how we think the world works. Uh, I'll talk more about it in a, in a minute, but basically do we see the world as ordered um, or do we see the world as, as complex? And how we see the world, um, if we think that the, the, the phenomenon we're dealing with, society, is inherently uh, empirically complex, uh, that gives us a different frame of how to then approach and epistemological means our knowledge, our belief about knowledge, how we can understand such a system. Is it even possible to understand a system that is complex? Um, and if not, uh, how do we then engage with that? How do you develop knowledge about what we are working with? And this is very much about what adaptive peace building is about. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that as we go along. So by applying some of the insights that we can derive from complexity theory and how we understand how what we know about how complex systems behave uh, that can help us to to strengthen our ability to prevent or manage or recover conflict in complex social systems so uh, i'll i'm not uh, we don't i don't have the time to go into much detail about uh, complex systems but uh, i'm just going to talk you through this uh, definition of of complex systems so basically, we're talking about a particular type of system um, that has the ability to adapt um, and that demonstrates emergent properties, including self-organizing behavior. So if you think of a, a social system, and let's think about the economy as maybe an, as something that we can all relate and, and think about, the economy in, in Italy or in, or in Norway or the global economy is not something that anybody controls. Of course, the central bank and the government tries to, to control the economy, but the only thing they can actually do is to try and influence the economy by you know, increasing interest rates, etc. So the economy is an example of a social system that is complex. It adapts and there's new things coming about. It emerge, things are emergent. In other words, if you think of a, a uh, a, a system that is uh, not complex. So for instance, the engine of a car, um, the, the engine of the car can't change. It can't suddenly develop a new capacity or new behavior, but economies can develop new behavior um, and can change itself depending on, on, on situations. And this is what we call self-organizing behavior. The way that economy changes and develops is not because somebody is in charge and somebody, uh, you are the driver of the car or you're the engineer of the engine of a car. Um, the economy self-organizes, it responds and it responds by, this is, goes to the next few lines in this definition, this, this uh, complex behavior comes about and is maintained as a result of the dynamic and non-linear interaction of a large number of its elements. So in the economy, you have economic agents. It's all of us but it's also corporations, it's the government. These are all you know, actors or agents in the economy, right? And the behavior amongst them is dynamic, meaning it's constantly changing and developing. It's not static and it's non-linear, meaning that the, the behavior is not always uh, directly causal. Uh, a small input can have a large effect uh, or a large input can have a small effect. So the the effects are not always what you expect. So let me give you an example from development, right? If we, if we undertake a development project in a particular country, let's say we, we uh, 
and do a, a, a development project where we provide some uh, small cash loans in a particular community. And that has a very good effect. Then we would think linearly that if you, if you scale that project up significantly, that that will have even a better effect. But we often find that a project like that works at a certain scale, but then if you, if you increase or scale it up beyond a certain level, it changes the dynamics to such an extent that it starts having, let's say, a negative effect. So that's a nonlinear, uh, the nonlinear effects that you have. It's different in a car. In a car, it will always have, you know, if you, if you apply more, uh, uh, if you, uh, you know, make the car go faster by applying more pressure on the, uh, on the accelerator, then the car will always go faster in the same way that you expect. That's a linear reaction. And these actors in the economy that I mentioned, or in any society, they act based on the information to them locally. Right? So you and I, we make decisions about um, what to buy or not to buy, or whether we're going to invest in studying for a degree, based on the information you and I have from our friends, neighbors, from the internet. So it's information available to us locally. We don't understand, we don't know the whole system and the behavior of the whole system. But each of us, based on the information we have locally and our understanding, our interpretation of what is happening, we take certain actions. And then all of the different actions we take as individuals, that collectively becomes the behavior of the system, that influences the behavior of the system. And so there you will find things like swarm behavior, that we, we copy each other, we, we follow fashion, we, we see that there's a, a certain trend that we follow, right? So that's part of the dynamics. And basically we work, and the system as a whole works on feedback. So yeah, we can talk about positive and negative feedback. If, uh, if I'm getting a, a very bad review on this lecture, Roberto will not uh, invite me again next year, right? So that is, uh, that's feedback in the system for him to know what is working in this course and what is not working in the course. And we all make judgments all the time based on the feedback we receive from the system on our actions. So this gives you a, uh, an understanding of what, what we mean with complexity and how complex systems uh, behave. And it's important for me to that you think about this way when we talk about uh, peace building and resilience in social systems. Because if we understand a social system as complex and behaving in this way, it means we have to think differently about how we do uh, peace building. So one way to, to understand this uh, is to think about the difference between complicated and complex systems. And um, I'll compare here, you know, like what I call rocket science or basically any mechanical system and peace science. Now, we all know that when we talk informally amongst each other and something is not very complicated, we would say, oh, it's not rocket science as if rocket science is the most complicated thing we can think of. Um, I think after today's lecture, I hope that whenever somebody says, uh, uh, well, it's not rocket science, you can explain to them that peace science is much more complex than rocket science. And uh, what you are studying uh, is, and, and what we are trying to achieve with uh, peace is much more complex because once you, it's of course very complicated to, to design a rocket uh, that you can send to space, uh, like uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX and NASA and all these people are doing. You need a lot of engineers, a lot of different types of scientific knowledge. And uh, there's a lot of uh, design and experimentation going in. But when, once you have basically arrived at a certain design, uh, then you can expect that that rocket will behave more or less the same time in the same way every time you shoot it up into the sky. Sometimes something goes wrong, but but most of the time uh, you it works. In fact, the the rocket still being used most for space travel at the moment is still the Suez rockets, which was designed in the 60s. Right. So. One of the core differences between something that is complicated and something that is complex is this irre irreproducibility of, of social design. So for instance, in South Africa, after the apartheid uh, regime came to an end, 
we had something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and this was a very uh, generally seen as a very successful instrument that was used to help to bring about reconciliation in South Africa. Now, that worked very well in South Africa at that time, but we can't use, and we have tried to replicate it in many other places subsequently, but it has never quite worked in any of the other places in Sierra Leone or, or uh, uh, in different other places in the world where we've tried to, to reproduce that experiment. In fact, it can't even be used in South Africa today because the situation is so different, even although it's the same history and the same culture and so on. So this is what makes uh, social systems so complex is that we, when we have generated something, we can't necessarily reproduce it. The problem with peace building in the past is that many people have approached it as if it's a mechanical problem uh, and has come with very, um, you know, causally designed interventions uh, and had this expectation that we as international experts have the expertise to make an analysis of a conflict system, uh, design a solution. And we, we thought that we had the, the capability, the agency to implement that solution and to bring about peace in a particular country. Uh, and we can see now after many years that that approach has, has failed. And that is why we are you know, looking for, for different approaches. And, and that's the context and with which I have um, proposed this adaptive peace building approach. So we talk broadly about the liberal peace as kind of the, the mainstream approach to peace building that we, we tried, you can say more or less since the end of the Cold War um, until recently, and in many cases, uh, this practice is, is still continued in some other form, right? And basically, uh, of course, liberal peace is informed by, you know, the kind of capitalism versus communism, democracy versus autocratic systems that have emerged victorious after the end of the Cold War. And, and that subset of the free market system uh, political freedoms, uh, democracy, the sign of institutions we have developed in, in, in the Western hemisphere um, is what we broadly think of when we talk about liberal or new liberal approaches to peace. And what has happened is, is we have, uh, in our engagement with other societies and working with them on peace, we basically said, look, uh, this seems to work well for us. Why don't you just uh, apply the same standards in, in the same approach in your in your in your countries, and um, so the content of the piece that we peace building type of work that we carried out um, was based on pre-existing um, standards. Uh, it can say international standards or Western standards like democracy, human rights, certain values, etc. Right? And and the end state was predetermined. So after you carry out this peace building programs so you will arrive at a state and you will have democracy you'll have a constitution you'll have a parliament etc um, and peace building was essentially seen as this process of facilitating the process of adopting and integrating this liberal peace values and institutions in other countries um, and so it was experienced as something that was kind of top down imposed by these experts from the west um, and presented as something that's, you know, technical knowledge, it's expertise, it's, it's international best practice. And so this is the, the, what I would call the determined design approach to peace building uh, that we can see after spending millions, billions of dollars in, in Afghanistan uh, or the Congo or currently in Mali or many of these other places uh, where we, are, we have tried this and have, in, or for the most part, miserably failed. Um, I mean, I'm not throwing out everything that has been achieved. Uh, we have, uh, in many cases, managed to, to save lives, to reduce suffering. But in very few cases have we been able to arrive at a self-sustainable peace. And where that has happened, it's been mostly because of locally owned processes rather than internationally imposed uh, kind of... Uh, transfer of, of the liberal peace model. So in contrast to, to this uh, liberal peace or determined design approach, 
um, I'm going to introduce to you the concept of adaptive peace building. So adaptive peace building is an approach where the peace builders, together with the communities and people affected by the conflict, actively engage in, in a structured process, and I'll explain that structure to you, to sustain peace. And they do so by employing an iterative, a continuous process of learning and adaptation. Um, and in the bottom bullet here, you, you see I talk about epistemology, in other words, our theory of knowledge. And I say this is an in inductive approach for coping with complexity and uncertainty. So if we go back to, to what we understand as the kind of complex and uncertain social systems that we are working with when we say peace building, that we are trying to influence and we know how complex systems operate, we are saying that because it's complex and uncertain and non-linear, we are not able to know beforehand what the solutions are. Uh, we've seen that fail in the determined design approach. So instead of, or alternatively to come with a pre-designed idea, we have to inductively um, figure out as we go along uh, what's going to work in this particular context. And we have to do that together with the communities and people. It's not something we do as peace building experts to the people, but it's something in which we, the communities and people affected by the conflict have the main agency. And we are just process facilitators as peace builders that help along this process. And we realize that inductively we have to, to learn together and constantly adapt what we are trying to do from the feedback that is generated. So this is the, the essentially the adaptive peace building approach. So it, if, I, if I go into it in a little bit more detail, I would say that the adaptive peace building approach is aimed at uh, supporting systems, so social systems, societies, communities, but also international level systems or national level systems to develop the resilience and here we come to how the role that resilience plays in peace building to so help these social systems, these communities to develop the resilience and ro ro robustness. They need to cope with this constant changes that they're experiencing, especially when there's some form of disruption. So to cope with the adapt and, and to change. And we do that by helping them to develop greater levels of complexity and self-organization in their social institutions. So essentially, we work with them to make their social systems more resilient uh, by helping those social systems develop more social capital we discussed earlier and the better ability to, to self-organize and deal with the challenges uh, themselves. And this can happen at uh, local level. So we're talking about you know, a particular community, maybe the community in which you live or communities in particular countries, uh, whether it's Syria or Mali, uh, that, that experience conflict and their traditional institutions or civil society that work with them, or it could be in Kosovo or in somewhere else in the Balkans, or it could be national, right? So at the level of a state or a society, Serbia or Bosnia Herzegovina or Kosovo, right? And that state's society, uh, social institutions and state institutions, the formal institutions and the informal institutions at the national level. But it can also be regional and international. So if you think of the, the role of the European Union and how it deals with the Balkans, is it resilient enough? Does it have the institutions uh, that are capable enough of dealing with the, the problem in the Balkans, right? Um, there's one, and the last bullet here on this slide that I want to point out is that there's, a, there's potentially in a contradiction between saying that as peace builders, we want to help a society to develop the ability to self-organize, right? Because self-organization implies that it must be something that comes from the self, from the society itself. And it's not necessarily something that from the outside we can build or contribute to. And so this is why this participatory iterative process of engaging with a society is so important because it, it needs to come from within but it also needs some stimulus, some facilitation, uh, because uh, we can see that many of these societies on their own have not been able to get out of the situation that they're in, right? So this is where the, 
the interaction, the relationship between the peace builders and the um, societies affected uh, is so important. A very important principle though that we need to keep in mind is, is uh, the do no harm principle. Uh, I don't know if there's any of you that that are science fiction fans or, or who grew up with Star Trek, but in Star Trek, you have the prime directive, right? Which is that you, you not to interfere in, in, in uh, pre, uh, um, uh, uh, societies that have not developed at a certain a level. Um, Pre-warp drive societies, I think they call it. So we need to be very cautious that when we and engage with the society through a peace building process that we don't do that in, in a way that can cause harm. And one of the ways that we've seen that to determine design process have caused harm is that they have interfered so much, they have suggested so much, they've taken up so much space that they've actually harmed the abilities of these societies to, to self-organize. Um, and this is why adaptive peace building is also a consciously normative approach to peace building. It's an approach where we consciously choose to, to, to hold back, to self-censor, to make sure that we, we don't impose ideas, uh, we don't take up the space and that is needed for the society to develop its own solutions. One way to think about that is that, you know, every time you solve a problem, for that society, you deprive it of the opportunity to learn itself how to solve that problem. Um, and it needs to learn itself. Its own institutions need to develop the capacity to deal with these problems. So finding that balance is of course, one of the most critically difficult things uh, to do in peace building between how much stimulus facilitation do you need to do and where do you need to stand back and, and, and let a society um, develop solutions itself, which also means that it must fail itself sometimes, because we learn from our failures, um, not only from our successes. In South Africa, for instance, to give you an example, we had a, a problem with our previous president, um, and it's only through um, many social struggles, and for instance, parliament interpreting the right of uh, certain institutions, we've got something called the public defender, and whether the president have to follow the recommendations of the public defender or not. It's only through those challenges that as a democracy, we have developed those institutions further and understood. And there's been interpretations of the constitution, which then helped us to, now we know next time uh, better what the rights of, let's say the public defender is versus the president, but you're not going to develop those, that knowledge as a society if you don't go through that struggles yourself, right? So this is the big problem with the determined design approach. You can't um, arrive at a Western style democracy on paper. You have actually have had to go through the struggles that the West went through to develop that system, to make sense of and understand and own that system yourself. And this is where the local ownership dimension of adaptive peace building is so critically important. Uh, in, from a complexity theory perspective, we understand the important, that self, that important role that self-organization plays in complex systems to maintain and manage complex systems. So we know that for a society or a community or an international institution to be resilient, they need to be able to be, have the capacity to self-organize. And that is why we need to give so much room, so much uh, help for those institutions to become resilient enough to become self-sustaining. And why that must come from the local culture, the history, the socioeconomic context, the experience, the trial and error of that society struggling with its own problems, developing its own institutions for those institutions to become uh, sophisticatedly complex self-organizing enough to sustain themselves. Um, and that's why, you know, local agency is so important uh, in the whole concept of adaptive peace building and, and, and our understanding of how these societies develop. This is also, again, of course, where our knowledge about resilience is very important and how we, how we think about resilience. 
And so our focus on resilience is, is exactly a, a focus or a shift away from the kind of determined design thinking about uh, we need to control systems, we need to bring order into a society or an institution uh, to understand that no, actually the capacity of an institution or a community to manage conflict relates to its internal resilience, not to kind of uh, the, the, it's not just the formal institutions, it's not that somebody is controlling that system, um, it's about the, the total interaction of the informal and social systems. Uh, it's not just about the president uh, or even parliament, but it's about the whole complex system, a set of institutions that, that make this state and the checks and balances and the relationship between, between them formally and informally. Um, and that is why uh, there's such a focus in resilience on helping communities, societies, nations, institutions to develop that social capital they need to, to self-organize and self-sustain themselves. And there's essentially two ways in which you can, you know, influence a social system uh, or any kind of system, right? You can, uh, one way is to, to influence the flow of information. So the more information actors, we took, if we, we spoke about the economy before, right? The more information the individual actors and the, and the and other economic actors have about the system, uh, and about developments in the system, the more informed decisions they can take, right? Uh, and we see in many societies where there's a lack of information, people will try to, to do things that may not be very effective or even useful. Um, and so that's why one way of influencing self-organization in systems is by uh, facilitating and modulating the flow of information. And the other one is by stimulating the emergence and interconnectedness of networks. We saw in our study of social capital, how important social networks are. Uh, networks in a community, networks between different levels, between different communities, between the local to the global. All these networks are critical in terms of exchanging information uh, and influencing each other. We spoke earlier about that the elements in a system make decisions uh, based on the information they get locally from others, right? So the networks give you access to information and, and become cooperative and supporting. And we see those societies that have strong social networks where there's stronger social cohesion, et cetera, are more resilient to, to conflict than those that are uh, a very weak networks that are very uh, operating in silos, have uh, where there's a lot of mistrust between different societies and classes, etc., cetera, or, or people from different language groups or ethnic groups and so on. Um, so I wanted to, to go through two things with you, which I'm going to skip a little bit so that um, I don't take too much time. One was how do we understand peace building differently if we apply complexity? And I think I've managed, mentioned many of these things already, but I suggest you, you go through these next couple of slides on your own. And this one is basically about how an adaptive approach thinks differently about order and risk. Uh, essentially, in the kind of a determined, determined system, order is seen as some, uh, or disorder is seen as something which is undesirable, whereas in adaptive complex systems, we understand that change is normal. Uh, and even that forms of tension and conflict is normal and necessary to bring about evolution and change and transformation. But it's the violent conflict that, that we want to avoid. Um, and this has views on how we can understand conflict, right? So the determined approach uh, has this idea that we can actually understand a conflict. Experts can understand a conflict by you know, a certain amount of, of, of research. Whereas our adaptive approach says that that knowledge is always provisional because the system is continuously emerging uh, and continuously adapting and changing. And we can never predict with any level of certainty how that system will react. And therefore, you need to understand that that knowledge we have is, is you know, provisional and that we need to have additional tools to constantly develop new understandings. And this is where the, the kind of uh, approach of adaptive peace building comes in. 
And this also, of course, you can imagine informs the way we do planning and whether it's more top down, whether it's, whether it's more bottom up, whether we, in, in the adaptive approach, we obviously anticipate very much that there will be changes that we need to adapt to all the time. Um, whereas in the determined design approach, it's more kind of you plan and if things, uh, if you don't execute your plan exactly the way you, you thought it was going to be, you, you've done something wrong and you need to explain why have you deviated from the plan, right? Um, so it's that kind of different approach to planning and also to prioritization and about obviously how you then manage both your institutions, your peace building, but also society and how you think about coordination in the society. So I would suggest that you, you look at those yourself in your own time. Um, and then in this section, I wanted to focus on, okay, the previous section was about how do we understand conflict differently from a complexity perspective. And this is more about how do we do peace building differently? What kind of actions do we do differently? And here, uh, I'm proposing a specific adaptive peace methodology, which is something that is also developed in, in the um, development field and in other fields where they call about adaptive development. You may have come across that. There's something called adaptive leadership. And many of these approaches basically have the same inductive approach I mentioned earlier. So um, because we don't have a predetermined idea or accept that we can't have a predetermined idea of uh, what the solution is and how to arrive at it. We need to constantly explore and experiment with what potential solutions can be. So you need to have an intent. Of course, you need to know what you want to achieve. So and that you need to do together with the with the uh, the affected community. And so you need to you know define your piece that you want to pursue. Um, but then. Um, how to actually do that, we don't exactly know. So the idea here is that you need a variety of, of potential solutions. So instead of what you would typically do in the, in the predetermined design approaches, you would make an analysis and come up with kind of one solution that you implement. Here we're saying we don't know which solution is going to work. So you basically need to experiment by doing a number of things simultaneously and then have a very strong monitoring process to see through feedback, which of these experiments, if you like, uh, which of these different interventions are working better than others. And then you need a, a, a very particular decision-making process where um, quite regularly, you have to stop and reflect and decide which of those interventions to continue with, which of them to, to abandon, which of them to scale up and so on. So this is more at the programmatic level, how you would engage with the actual piece design, right? And this you have to, to do repeatedly. Uh, it's not as if you arrive at a point where you've kind of solved the problem. Um, you may have solved a particular problem, but when you talk about pieces I spoke about earlier, this is something that, that in the larger context, uh, it really is never ending. So there's a constant iterative process. And that's why we call this an, an intent-driven inductive adaptation process that you can do at all scales, whether it's a program at the community level or whether it's a kind of a program at the European Union level, um, you can follow more or less the same adaptive process. This is a bit of a schematic uh, example of just showing the iterative process of going through those different cycles over and over again. Um, and one of the elements here is that, of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, you, you are dealing with a complex society in that society, there are certain actors that are profiting and benefiting from the current situation. And when you try to change that system, they're going to either try to, you know, undermine what you're doing, or they're going to try to find ways around what you're doing. So even a solution that may have worked well at step one and two can suddenly start not working so well at step three because people have figured out a way how to do it. So none of these, uh, let's say you find something that works well, it doesn't mean it will always work well. And therefore you need to constantly monitor and change and adapt as you go along when dealing with these societies. Now I'll end off by just sharing with you one practical example because very often when I uh, 
share this kind of thinking, uh, especially with kind of practitioner audiences, people who actually work in peace or development. They say it sounds very interesting. We can we can relate to what you are saying, but it sounds too complicated. You know, we will never be able to do it in in our system. And so, uh, we were very lucky to get an opportunity to actually implement this in a particular context. We were invited in uh, 2017 uh, by the United Nations Department of Peace Operations to help them to assess their performance systems that they had in, in at that point to judge whether a particular peace operation let's say the peace operation in the congo is uh, performing well or not and essentially based on our analysis we found that they have many different performance systems you know looking at individual performance and looking at the performance of let's say uh, a particular a subsystem but they were not able to to make an overall judgment about whether a particular mission is performing well or not, partly because that is a very complex system that have so many different uh, elements and so many different influences based on which you can make that kind of judgment. So we, we propose that they design a, a comprehensive performance assessment system um, in a, a, and they accept, accepted our recommendation and invited us to, to help them to develop the system. And Emery Brousset and I helped them to develop the system and have been helping them to implement the system since that time. And today, um, most of the United Nations peacekeeping operations are implementing this system. So here we're talking about a huge institution, budget of about $6 billion at the moment, about 100,000 people deployed in uh, 10, 13, 14 peace operations all across the world in some of the most difficult places like Mali or Sudan. Uh, where you have you know 17,000 peacekeepers spread out all over the country, military, police, uh, political people, developmental people. So very, very complex system that you need to assess whether it's performing or not. And in short, we used you know basically the same approach which I just outlined to you. We focused very much on a on a context-based analysis. So instead of saying that, you know, People in New York have the answer, and this is one way to do peacekeeping. Each mission had to, based on their own context, what is the conflict in the Congo that we are trying to influence, to understand the conflicts and then design their own implementation plan based on their understanding of the context. Of course, they get a mandate from the Security Council, which is their intent, but how they implement that mandate in that context is what this um, initial step is about. And then they, uh, develop a plan and part of that plan is then also developing your indicators which is going to help you to generate that feedback to know whether you are achieving what you wanted to achieve and we are encouraging them to try many different things simultaneously not just to have one one idea of doing something and then if it doesn't work you've wasted you know two years on on a particular project but to try many different projects simultaneously and these missions uh, were in the past assessed um, somewhat on an annual basis through you know reports they provide to the Security Council and so on, sometimes through strategic reviews, you know, once every few years or so. And we said, no, you need to assess yourself on a quarterly basis. So every four months, because the situation is so dynamic and changing constantly, every four months you actually need to sit down and look at those indicators and make a judgment about what adaptations you need to make. And then very important was to you know, generate the information and present it to the leadership so that they can make these decisions uh, about what to change. And of course, this helps them to get an understanding of whether the mission is performing well, which elements of the mission is challenging, where do they need to you know, divert resources and so forth. Um, and so there's a whole system that we've developed uh, through dashboards that, that uh, give them the ability to constantly monitor and make decisions about what is working and what is not working. So the whole point with this example is just to show you that, that even in a very complex bureaucracy like the United Nations peacekeeping, it's possible to apply these kind of ideas uh, and apply un understandings about how complex systems function and how we have to therefore plan and think about engaging with these systems differently than what we did before in from a kind of a very narrow linear engineering based approach to 
to planning, which is what they also did before in, in peacekeeping. So that brings me to, to my conclusion. Um, um, basically, I wanted to just summarize for you um, what the role of resilience is in this context of, of adaptive peace building. Uh, that we think of peace building as something which is basically aimed at facilitating the emergence of, you know, social capital, self-organization, uh, resilience, adaptive capacity in the societies that we're dealing with or the institutions that we're dealing with. And that adaptive peace building is a, a normative participatory engaging with, with the, the people affected by the country. Uh, something that is emergent, so the solutions have to come out through the process of engagement, and something that is inductive. In other words, we don't come with preconceived solutions. We we develop the we are constantly developing and adapting the the, the solutions, if you like, as we go along. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Roberto and, and and all your students for patiently listening to me. I'm now going to hand the floor back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Let me just uh, they stop sharing. Sorry, there we are. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, well, thank you. A very very rich uh, uh, presentation. I. Um, let me say just to start that uh, I am going to, of course, to share the presentation with all students. So so they will. Uh, they will be able to, to go through and the lecture will be posted online so they can, uh, if they missed uh, this or that detail, they, they will be able to um, uh, go back and, and uh, fill in the missing information. Um, so I, we have a, um, about 15 minutes according to our own uh, normal uh, schedule and so um, I'm very happy to, <clears throat> to give the students an opportunity to um, ask questions or make any comment or um, any clarification point or anything else. Um, we have, oh, here it is, let me, maybe I'll read the question for everyone else, so you, Cedric, can answer if you want. Um, I was asking myself, with regard to the adaptive peace methodology, couldn't it, couldn't it be considered too costly, considering that it should implement simultaneously different parallel solutions? Could this discourage its use in international organizations and NGOs which work on a budget? Yes. Um... That would kind of be a, uh, a a thinking that we all have, right? That uh, I was going to say a kind of a, a normal economic cost benefit type of uh, analysis. But uh, you can ask yourself the the other question: If you're implementing something which is not working, uh, what is the cost of that, right? So if if you're you're now not doing uh, you're not experimenting with a number of smaller interventions. You are putting all your money in one on, on one horse, if you like, and uh, that horse is not working. That's also very costly, and and very uh, potentially harmful to the society that you are working with. So, from that perspective, a a more efficient um, approach would be to to try different things. And as I said, very regularly check which ones are working better than others. And then you and then you stop doing the ones which are not working and you are paying more attention to the ones that are working and you create further diversity with them. So you end up, uh, you, let's say your portfolio is $1 million. You're still working on $1 million. Uh, it's just that you're now working in four or five different ways instead of just in, in, in one way. And probably it means that you are reaching more people and that you are trying uh, different things, which, which hopefully would be overall, you know, more effective and less costly and less harmful. So that's the thinking to uh, in in this uh, in this approach. Very good. Um, anyone else? Any other? Let me just also add to Virginia that. It, there is a there is a cost also in effort, right? Because the, now the peace builders have to really engage with the local community. Uh, 
they have to engage in monitoring, they have to think through, uh, they have to meet regularly. So, I mean, there is a, there is a, there's a transaction cost that comes with this kind of system. But again, and, and we had exactly in, in the United Nations example that I mentioned to you, you know, many people would say, oh, I don't have time for this, you know, I have to do my work. And uh, we more or less had the same conversation and say, well, you can, you can spend your time doing your work, uh, but if what you're doing is not effective, how do you know that? Maybe you're wasting your time. You think you're spending your time on working, but actually you're wasting your time or you're even being harmful. Uh, isn't it more effective to actually invest in that time and make sure that you maybe even do less, but what you're doing is actually effective? Uh, so that's the, that's the trade-off we have to make uh, constantly in this kind of approach. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, okay. Any other comment or question? <clears throat> Otherwise, I I, um, I I want to I want I would like to give the students the opportunity also to to to, to reflect a little bit on on what was uh, said. So, and um, I um, I like to ask. Well, I I limit myself to to one question because you you raised many issues and points of, of interest. But um, I wonder whether you can say a little bit about. Um, um, how this approach was received by United Nations uh, officers in the field, because um, the, there is in any inst complex institution, uh, there, is a, there is a sort of path dependency and resistance to change. And uh, so uh, uh, regardless of the, of the goodness of what is proposed, uh, um, uh, there is always a, a, a difficulty in explaining uh, in showing a different way of conducting operations and so on. So I wonder whether you can say a little bit about this. Uh, and um, and um, I am not. I I'm not sure. I I understood if I understood correctly. Um, um, uh, I'd like you to 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 confirm if I understood correctly that uh, that uh, currently the United Nations is uh, is widely adopting the adaptive peace approach. Is that correct? And and the final point. I know we have, we don't have much time, but uh, if you could give just a just a, a hint uh, at least uh, to our students in terms of. Uh, how, uh, in terms of a, of a concrete peace operation, when uh, where this pro this approach was uh, was implemented? I'm sorry, I I I plan to ask one question, but it's actually <laughs> more than one. No problem. No, as with as with any social change process, uh, as I mentioned before, if we are trying to intervene as peace builders in a society or if you're trying to intervene in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations with a new idea, it's more or less the same reaction. There are some people who see that change as an opportunity to, to do better, to, to, to you know, address some of the problems they've been experiencing uh, as a way of doing something interesting and what they think is meaningful. And there are others who, as you say, you know, are maybe stuck in a bit of path dependency. Oh, I've been in the UN doing this for 25 years and every three years a new consultant comes with a new idea and then we have to try adopt new systems and I don't have time for that. I just want to finish my job or, or there are winners and losers, right? There are people who, who let's say have, have uh, invested in another system that will now lose power if this system is adopted. So, so the dynamics in any institution or society is, is very similar. So the, in, in this particular context with the UN peacekeeping, uh, there was enough buy-in uh, to, to adopt the system and to roll it out. And then there was, uh, over time, I would say, enough buy-in for it to become implemented. And of course, throughout that time, there were many, many of people who were, who were not so excited about it. Uh, so to answer your second question, um, you probably won't find anybody in the UN that says that we are implementing adaptive peace. But uh, if you ask them if they're implementing the comprehensive performance assessment system, then the answer is, is yes. Uh, 
and, and I know that it is based on, on adaptive peace principles and complexity principles, but when we introduce it to the United Nations or to colleagues in the field, we don't talk to them about complexity or, or uh, even uh, adaptive peace or adaptive peace building. But um, there are, uh, for instance, the, the concept adaptation, I remember when we first you know, used that concept in explaining that really the aim of the comprehensive performance assessment system is to faci facilitate adaptation. People didn't understand what it meant and, and, uh, and discouraged us to, to use that word. But now, three years later, I see the word being used uh, throughout the UN system and in speeches by the Secretary General and it has become like resilience, a concept now that is widely accepted in the United Nations. So, so I wouldn't go so far as to say the UN is, adapt, is implementing adaptive peace, but the Department of Peacekeeping Operations is implementing the system to measure the performance of peacekeeping operations that is based on that system. And I do see many other examples of, of adaptive approaches elsewhere in the UN system as well. And so to give you, as you said, a very specific example. So you could have, for instance, the United Nations mission in the Congo and in the Congo, in the eastern part of the Congo, um, the main task of the, of the United Nations mission is to protect civilians that are being attacked by, by different armed groups, right? And so to protect civilians, they do different things, like they patrol, drive around with uh, military vehicles in the vicinity to try to deter, or they have uh, ways of, uh, for instance, they've created what they call community liaison officers in the different communities and they give them a phone and a SIM card and airtime and say call us if you hear there's a problem coming then we will come and so these are already two ways that I showed you now you can patrol or you can use mobile phones community networks and now you need to figure out which of these work better should we patrol more or should we invest more in community liaison offices both are aimed at achieving protection and there are many different things so the UN is probably doing a hundred different things all contributing to protection uh, in one or another way. And so through CPES, we are monitoring which of these are working better, how can we make them work, perform even and make them even more effective. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, let me see if um, anyone wants to take this opportunity to um, ask any question or make a comment and wait a few seconds. So I guess uh, uh, we are a couple of minutes early, uh, no harm in <laughs> ending two minutes earlier. So, so well, I, on behalf of everyone, uh, uh, Cedric, thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing your, your perspective and your, your work and your ideas on this topic, which is certainly very uh, important and, and uh, we'll, we'll hear more in the future uh, on this, no doubt. Uh, and um, with regard to my students, I, I guess we'll, we'll continue very soon on addressing peace building related issues and particularly with regard to the Balkans. And so, um, so thank you again and, uh, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll uh, be able to see each other soon. Well, next time, uh, I'm very much looking forward to hosting you in Trento <laughs> in about one year time. For, when, for thank you very much, Robert. And I, I should have used, now that I think about it, an example from Kosovo because uh, ah, we, please. we did also attend, uh, visit the mission in Kosovo, Unmik, and, and, and uh, uh, introduced to the comprehensive of the, the CPAS, uh, Comprehensive Performance Assessment. So they are also introducing and using the system to to determine, you know, uh, help the mission to determine which part of what they're doing is, is more effective or not. Okay, excellent. So thank you so much, uh, Roberto, and to all of you uh, for your time and for listening to me. I appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm happy to take, you know, if the, if the students uh, reflect and come up with some questions, I can also respond by email later. Very good, excellent. I actually, I anticipate I will send you an email with, with maybe one or two points later on, but 
that's for later. Um, <laughs> well, thank you again, and uh, and um, and um, take care, and when we'll we'll chat another time soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Roberto. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.